Hey guys, one of the most widely requested tutorials on this channel has been the one on Material UI. So because so many people have asked me to do this again, I decided to go back to this series and actually finish it. So what we're going to do in this tutorial is we're going to focus on theming and that's going to be one of the subjects to close up this playlist. Now we're also going to take a look at server-side rendering and as I promised we're going to convert the app to use the new context API. Now for this tutorial like I said we're going to focus on theming and also styling. So what I did in the project over here is I actually updated all of the dependencies so if you go to package JSON you would see that all of the dependencies have been updated to their latest respective versions. Now in order to accommodate for the latest v1 update of Material UI, I actually had to update all of the import paths for all of the components. Now what do I mean by that? If we go to the footer component for example, we used to have the tabs as well as the tab component imported from a bit of a different path. We used to have something like Material UI slash tabs. Now since v1 the import path for all the components have been flattened and that means that all the components will now come from the same import path and in this case it will be at material UI slash core so you can now place all of your components in the same import statement aside from that this is the same repo as you saw before it basically has the same functionality you can add exercises you could also edit them and delete them now actually if you take a closer look there is a problem right now if you try to edit something let's say I want to edit bench press I want to change the title but the moment I start typing nothing happens why is that well as it turns out a few videos back I actually updated react from version 16.2 to 16.3 and one of the changes that I made was to update from using component will receive props to the new static get derived state from props. Now what I'm going to do here for a second is I'm actually going to bring back the old method. So I'll put back component will receive props and I'm also going to put in a console log statement so we can see that the method is actually being fired. I'm going to delete the empty line and I'll save the file. Now let me edit bench press for example. I click on the edit icon. Let's open the console. Right now the exercise in the app.js component and that refers to the currently selected exercise is bench press. If I select let's say overhead press that's going to change the selected exercise and that's why you see fired. That's because a new property is being passed to the form. The state is being updated and we're showing a different exercise on the right. Now let's say I go back to bench press. If I try to edit something in the form let's say I want to change the title to incline bench press. I'm going to click edit and then I see fired. But you could see that as I type something I don't actually see fired in the console and that's because we're not changing the properties that the form receives but we're actually working on the draft exercise that exists on the state. Now we'll bring back the new method and we're going to see if it actually behaves any differently. So I'll put in the same console log statement and I'm going to say fired. Let's try changing between exercises. I'm going to select overhead press and I'll change to bench press. You can see that the method is getting fired in the console. But if I try to edit the title again, I'm going to try to change it to incline bench press. You could see that even though the title is not getting changed in the UI, the method does get fired on every keystroke. So what's happening over here? Why do we get a new properties object on the form, but our state doesn't seem to change? Well, as it turns out, component will receive props and get derived state from props are seriously not the same. These are very different methods. Component will receive props will fire every time a component receives a new set of properties. So in this case, the form is getting new properties every time something changes on the app.js file. So for instance, the selected exercise might change, but at the same time, the get derived state from props is going to trigger every time before the render method. So every time the render method triggers, get derived state from props is also going to be invoked right before that method. And this is where the problem resides. So the state does get updated and it gets updated in this method, handle change. But because the state gets updated, the render method also gets triggered. And since it gets intercepted by get derived state from props, we're extracting the old exercise object from the old properties. And then we're resetting that object on the state. So if I do console log, let's do exercise. This exercise actually refers to the exercise from the properties object. So if I save that, the moment I start typing something, I see that same object in the console. And this object has the old title overhead press. And it has nothing to do with the title 
that I'm currently typing. So whatever value will return from this method is being set on the state. So even though we do update the state and handle change the moment you type, we overwrite that value from within get derived state from props. And that's where the bug emerges. Now fixing this bug is not a trivial issue. I'm going to open a new tab and let's go to the documentation for React. If we go to the blog section, the first blog you're going to see here talks precisely about that. It describes some of the common pitfalls when using derived state. And it also points you to the inherent issues of using component will receive props. Now, I would encourage you to check out this article on your own. But for our simple example, there's not that much we have to do. In fact, what we're going to do is we're actually going to get rid of this lifecycle method altogether. The other thing we're going to do is we're also going to remove the set state call with the initial state. Every time an exercise is being saved, we don't need to reset the state to the initial props or whatever the props happen to be at that moment. We're going to rely on the same state. And the very last thing we're going to do is inside of index.js on the exercises component, we're going to go to the bottom and we're going to find the form component. What we're going to do here is we're going to add a special key property. And the key property is going to refer to the ID of the exercise. Now this ID is being extracted at the top. You can see it over here in the exercise object. I'm going to close off the console because we're not going to need it for the time being. And if we save this file, let's see if this helps. I'm going to try switching between exercises. It seems to work. The reason that it works is because we're updating the currently selected exercise. When a new exercise gets selected, we're passing a new ID property to the key attribute. The thing about the key attribute is you've probably seen it before on the lists. It's a very common thing to put when you have a list of items. But the key attribute, as it turns out, can also be used in standalone components. If the value of the key attribute changes, the component will remount. And this is exactly what we need. See, our form actually represents a temporary state of the exercise. It contains a draft for the exercise. It has a title, description, and the category of muscles. But this object is temporary. It only gets saved to the application state or to the store once you actually press the edit button. If you don't press it, the state doesn't get saved. So to save the state, we do need to make sure that the form component is still a controlled component. So we do need to keep track of the local state, but we also need to reset that local state whenever the selected exercise changes. So going back to the bench press example, if I change it to incline bench press, the title over here gets saved on the state, it's the title attribute, but it doesn't get saved on the application state over here in the exercise object. It only gets saved the moment I click on the edit button and the title of the exercise that's being selected changes on the application state as well. In this case, we don't really have to listen to any prop updates because of the key attribute. Whenever the ID changes, the form component over here will be remounted and the new state will be reinitialized in the constructor over here. When we request the initial state, this is the value that'll be returned based on the exercise that's being selected. And of course, we're still able to create new exercises as well. So for example, I'll create a test exercise. Let's put something, some dumb information. The exercise gets created. We're still able to see it. We can edit it. We can also delete it. So everything works as expected. As far as the validation goes, I left a comment over here that we still had to validate the form. So for example, editing one of the exercises, we want to make sure that when you edit the exercise, you're not able to save it unless you have some data in it. So for example, if I delete the title, I shouldn't be able to save it because an exercise doesn't make sense without the title. Now, what we can do here is we can actually add a condition to the button. So for example, we can have a disabled attribute and we could say that the button needs to be disabled if there's no title or if there's no muscles, in other words, the category. So if I save that, if I try to edit one of the exercises, I delete the title and I'm not able to edit because the button gets disabled. And the same thing is going to go for the modal over here as well. So you can only create a new exercise as long as you provide a title as well as a category. And we can leave off the description as optional. Lastly, the form doesn't really look that well on desktop devices. So for instance, if I try to edit something, the form is actually really small and the same also extends to the modal. So if I go back to our code, one thing I can do over here is I can actually go back to the top 
and let's remove this style altogether. Let's not set the width to any fixed value. I'm going to remove the width styles helper. We can actually also remove it from this component as the import statement. Next, we can also get rid of classes. The other thing we could do is we can simply pass the full width attribute. So this will make the element full width instead. It's gonna take as much width as it possibly can. I'm gonna remove the classes reference. Let's also remove the last one on the text field, on the description. So I'm gonna save that, and if we try to edit something, now you can see that the form actually takes full width. So if we take a look on the desktop device, this is what it's gonna look like. Now in our dialog, what we can do is we can go back to that file, let's go back to dialog. So to make it full width, again we can pass in the same full width attribute, and then we can also specify the maximum width. Now for that I'm actually gonna open the documentation so we can see what's going on. So let me go to material UI, I'm gonna open up the docs. And in fact, what I'm gonna do actually is I'll go to the component API. So let's look for dialog over here. As you're gonna see, one of the properties deals with the maximum width. And that determines the maximum width of the dialog. And there's a few options over here. There's extra small, small, and medium. So let's copy that value. I'll go back to the app and I'll paste it in. And for now, let's use the extra small value. Now the default one is actually small. So if you save that, if you try opening, this is what it's gonna look like. The medium one is even larger. So if I save it, this is the medium one. So for now, I'm gonna use the extra small one. On a desktop device, it's gonna look something like this. And I think this is just enough space for all of the text fields. Next, in our exercises component, we have an inline style over here. And that's because we're trying to give the second heading some spacing at the top. Now, there's an easier way to do this. We can simply put in gutter bottom property. And this way we can remove the style. This is what the updated version is gonna look like. The advantage of that is that we don't have to use the inline style. And then the other thing we can also do is we can take this typography and we can put it as the direct child of paper. So I'll fix the indentation and I'll also remove the fragment for now because now we're just basically going to have a single typography element over here. Some of the spacing here is really messed up. Let me fix that real quick. Okay, so now if you try to edit something, you're gonna see the title of the exercise showing up as well.